Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Ron Fricker, Interim Dean of the College, the Virginia Tech College of Science. I am delighted to welcome you to the J. Mark Sowers Distinguished Lecture Series in the College of Science. We are very pleased to have you join us today for this special talk by Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. The J. Mark Sowers Distinguished Lecture Series was initiated in February of 2017 with the goals of exchanging new and innovative ideas in science and providing opportunities for the university community and general public to interact with eminent scholars. Thanks to the generosity of Mark and Debbie Sowers, sponsors of today's event and this lecture series, we are able to do that not only within our college, but also to offer those ideals and inspirations to our larger community. Today's event is unique, as it is only the second time in this distinguished lecture that, that this distinguished lecture has been held entirely virtual. And while we enjoy the opportunities to gather in person, this webinar format has allowed us to expand our audience to alumni and friends across the Commonwealth and indeed across the globe. Additionally, it has enabled us to invite distinguished speakers from around the world who may not otherwise have been able to join us in Blacksburg, including today Professor Bell Burnell, who is joining us from the United Kingdom. So on behalf of the university, I would like to thank Mark and Debbie Sowers for their tremendous support in creating this lecture series. Their passion for science and discovery has made it possible for us to bring 13 distinguished scholars and exceptional speakers to Virginia Tech in recent years. Now I'll ask Professor Laura Anderson from our Department of Physics to please introduce Professor Bell Burnell. Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. As we'll hear more about in a few moments, Dr. Bell Burnell discovered pulsars as a graduate student in radio astronomy at the University of Cambridge opening up a new branch of astrophysics, work recognized by the award of a Nobel Prize to her supervisor. Her work since then has encompassed many branches of astronomy. She is currently a visiting professor at the University of Oxford and the Chancellor of the University of Dundee, Scotland. Her recent leadership roles in science include serving as the president of the UK's Royal Astronomical Society. And in 2008, she became the first female president of the Institute of Physics for the UK, UK and Ireland, and in 2014, the first female president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She's received many honors throughout her career, including a recent Royal Society Copley Medal and the prestigious Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics in 2018. Following the announcement of the Breakthrough Prize, Professor Bell Burnell decided to use the three million prize money to establish a graduate scholarship fund to support female minority and refugee students to pursue careers in physics research. This remarkable commitment to making science more inclusive and representative has been a common thread throughout Professor Bell Burnell's career. Indeed, on a personal note, many years ago when I was a PhD student in Oxford, I had the pleasure of hearing a lecture by Professor Bell Burnell that made a lasting impact on me. I look forward to hearing her perspectives again today. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Let me now see if I can get my PowerPoint up and running. Um, and I just check that I've got sound shared. I think I have. Right, so thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to do this talk. I too wish I could be with you. But of course, that's not possible at the moment, given the pandemic. I hope you are all keeping well in these times. Uh, so far, I have managed to avoid the COVID. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. I want to talk a bit more today about the discovery of pulsars and what happened when I was a graduate student. Oh, and the slides aren't moving on. Yes, they are. Right. So I'm going to be talking about radio astronomy. So I want to get your minds in the right wavelength, so to say, so to speak. So imagine you acquire about 2,000 of these satellite TV dishes. You connect them up with a good cable. You plug them into an excellent radio receiver, exceptionally excellent and point at a carefully chosen bit of the sky. And then we might, no, I haven't shared sound. Okay, um, I'm going to go backwards a few moments, folks. Um, that 
click that stop share share screen oh i was sharing sound that's disturbing professor i i think i'm going to recommend you turn off the laser pointer i think that was causing the problem okay uh, when you try and play the sound and then you can turn it back on yeah uh, that, i think that's a bit bit messy um right so let's go into Sorry, I've got stuck. You are screen sharing. I'll stop. No, it's not that I want to stop. It's the laser. Share sound, that should be okay. Oh dear, sorry, total mess. Um, I've lost my file altogether. Okay. Oh, come on. Uh, right. Okay, so share screen. Show. Beginning. Right, let's try again. So let's see if the sound works this time. That is actually one of these pulsars that you are listening to. It's a cool 10 to the power 27 tons. And that particular one is spinning on its axis 11 times a second. And a fairly typical pulsar, which is very keen to tell us about it, I think. Um, pulsar comes from pulsating radio star, and they are alternatively known as neutron stars. I'm going to be talking about radio astronomy, and I have up here the electromagnetic spectrum showing the full spectrum all the way from radio to gamma rays. Our eyes only respond to this tiny bit, the visible. But if we go out the red end of a spectrum, we get to infrared and then millimeter waves and then radio. And I'm going to be talking about astronomers who use these kinds of frequency waves, wavelength waves, um, to study the universe. So these are some radio telescopes. Um, this is Greenbank, West Virginia. Uh, this is Germany at Ethelsburg. This is in Britain. This is Jodrell Bank, which is one of the very early ones. Has just, sorry, I don't know why my screen keeps changing. Oh dear. So this middle one is at Jodrell Bank in Britain. It's one of the original radio telescopes, one of the first big ones. It's just been made a World Heritage Site, which means the university has to keep it standing, which will probably be quite expensive. But it's a great accolade, even if expense is an issue. This is the radio telescope that I helped build. 
um, and which was used in the discovery of pulsars. And you can see it's rather different in configuration from the other ones. A lot of copper wire in it. You can see the nice bluey green color of the copper. Um, a lot of wooden posts to keep the stuff up out of the wet grass and an effective but quite primitive radio telescope. It took six people the best part of two years to build this radio telescope. It has an area of about 57 tennis courts, um, almost 200 kilometers of wire and cable, and 2,000, over 2,000 antennae. My particular job was all the connections um, there were five guys who did most of the hammering of the posts into the ground. Um, for the physicists in the audience, the antennae, this is one row of them. This is another row of them. This is the, uh, the twin wire feeder bringing the signal down to more twi twin wire feeder, which fed into cable, which fed back into the laboratory. The wooden posts are the most obvious things. In a sense, they are important but they're not important except for keeping the whole lot well out of the wet grass, because wet grass is an electrical short, and there's quite a lot of bare wire there just waiting to be shorted by wet grass. Now it's frozen again. Right, okay. At that time, the University of Cambridge had one computer for the whole university. It took up a whole room because it was made with vacuum tubes. This was before transistors were commonly used. And it had memory comparable with your laptop and it served the whole university. So obviously very few people had time on it and we didn't. Our data came out on the uh, paper chart, uh, lots of it, 30 meters of this paper chart per day. 120 meters making a whole sky scan. Um, and I observed for six months, so I had over five kilometers of the stuff. It was quite a chore analyzing it, but my job was to find more quasars. And once again, my computer is behaving very peculiarly. Sorry about this. Oh dear. Looks like it's frozen. Um, okay, just hit the button harder. Sometimes works. Now, I very quickly got used to identifying the quasars that I was there to pick out. I also got quickly, quickly used to identifying radio interference. And there's a Example of low level interference here um, on the, towards the right center of this piece of chart. This big radio telescope is incredibly sensitive. And in those days, for example, cars were badly suppressed. And so if a car drove down the local road, we'd pick up electrical signals, radio signals from the sparks. Equally, if somebody was doing some arc welding, that generated radio waves. If the overhead power lines had issues and were sparking, that generated radio waves. So there was really rather a lot of potential sources of interference. And you get used to saying, oh, yeah, that's interference. But just occasionally, there was a little bit, this occupied about a quarter inch, half a centimeter, a little bit of signal that didn't look quite like interference which conveniently for us is just a few inches away on the same piece of chart. Uh, you can perhaps, if you look at them, see that this and this do not look quite the same. For example, here, the spikes go mainly upwards, whereas here they go up and down. And here on the right, you can see chart between the spikes. Whereas over here at the left-hand end, the spikes are so solid, you cannot see chart between them. When you're making that kind of comparison, you're actually doing a Fourier analysis. You're talking about the amplitudes of the signals, 
up and down, positive and negative, largely positive. You're talking about the frequencies present, lower frequencies. We can see space between the spikes, higher frequency, they're very closely packed. Now, I showed this to my supervisor and said, look, this funny signal, it's often not there, but when it is there, it's at the same right ascension and declination. It's keeping its same place amongst the constellations, amongst the stars. And my supervisor said, well, yes, fine, but you know, this signal occupies about a quarter inch. We can't really see what's happening. We need an enlargement. And with this technology, enlargement is easy. You simply run the chart paper faster underneath the pen and everything gets spread out. The snag is I couldn't leave the chart paper running at that speed all the time because it would get through a complete roll in 20 minutes. And it would be the grad student who lived at the observatory, putting a fresh roll of paper in the chart recorder every 20 minutes, day and night. That's not on. What the grad student has to do is go out to the observatory shortly before this signal is due to appear, if it appears, and do a high speed recording. And this is the famous first high speed recording. Along the bottom, I've got one second time pips. Uh, they were very conveniently broadcast for us. And the signal above is the signal I picked up. And you can see, particularly here, three pulses in a row, probably one missing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two or three missing, one or two more. And even when they go missing, they come back on beat. So they may miss a beat, but they keep the beat. The spacing of these pulses is about one and one third seconds. It's remarkably fast for an astronomical object. Astronomical objects are big, and broadly speaking, big things do things slowly. And something that goes at a rate of one and a third seconds is much smaller, like one and a third light seconds across maximum. Or indeed, actually even smaller than that, because if you look at the rise time, and fall time of the pulses, they're occurring in a tiny fraction of a second, and that limits the size of the object. So I contacted my thesis advisor. He was teaching in an undergraduate laboratory class at the time back in Cambridge, and his reaction was very cautious. Oh, well, that settles it. It's man-made. But he was interested enough to come out to the observatory the next day at the right time and stand looking over my shoulder to see what I was doing wrong. He couldn't find anything that I was doing wrong and the signal came in again. And we were able to establish that the period of the pulses, one and a third seconds, was to the accuracy we could measure it, the same as the previous day. And this becomes quite a problem. First of all, something that keeps beat this well and has sharp pulses is both small, sharp pulses, and big, keeps the beat. So it's big and it's small. Aha. Uh -huh. And we'd seen nothing like this in radio astronomy before at all. It really looks like something done by human beings. And we started to try and explain it away. And I kept making recordings. Uh, we looked to see if there was any change in the pulse period, if it was showing any signs of getting tired. No, it wasn't. Um, if there were any other changes in the pulse period. The name LGM was added later. I mean, all the notation is added later. LGM stands for Little Green Men. It was my nickname. Um, had I known how much publicity it was going to get, I would have been more circumspect in my choice of nickname, but I thought it was rather fun. So I continued making these recordings. Tony was thinking that if it really is little green men, they probably live on a planet which is going round their sun. And as their planet goes round their sun, 
Some of the time it's coming towards us and some of the time it's moving away from us. And we should see Doppler shifts on the pulse period due to the motion of little green men's planet round their sun. We did ultimately find a Doppler shift, but it was actually due to the motion of the Earth round the sun because Doppler shift works for the motion of the observer as well as motion of the source. We could see no evidence for motion of the source. So we'd proved that the Earth went round the sun, but otherwise weren't making a lot of progress. And then late one night, just before Christmas, I was working at my desk analyzing more records because these things were rolling in and I couldn't keep up. And I was looking at data from a totally different bit of sky and thought I saw something that looked a little bit like that first signal. It was a very difficult bit of the sky. There's a very strong radio source called Cassiopeia A. In Britain, it never sets. It stays above the horizon the whole time. I would normally observe it when it was due south, but when it was due north and close to the horizon, it could sometimes be picked up through the back of the telescope and it made a real mess for about 20 minutes of chart recording. And this other signal was in amongst that 20 minutes. Now, by now, it's very nearly Christmas time, major holiday in the UK. And I and my boyfriend are going back to my parents' home in Ireland to announce our engagement. It's kind of important that we're both there. You can't do his engagement and her engagement separately. But I was in danger of being locked in the laboratory at night. Uh, the janitor would lock at 10 o'clock and you could be locked in or locked out. Students didn't have keys. So I raced out as the janitor locked the doors behind me, knowing that I had to go out to the observatory at about two o'clock in the morning to do one of these fast recordings and see what this funny signal was from a different part of the sky. And I did that. Um, it was miserably cold. Equipment wasn't working properly, but I got it to work for five minutes on the right setting at the right time. And in came another signal. This time, slightly different period, but whereas the first one was one and a third seconds, this was one and a quarter seconds. It's something similar. So what are these things? Um, it can't really be Joe Bloggs driving down the road in a badly suppressed car after work. He's getting off work four minutes earlier a day, 28 minutes a week, and this has been going on now for a month or so. We asked a colleague who had a radio telescope, a separate radio telescope working at the same band, and with a separate receiver to see if they could see it. Um, and they could. So it wasn't some funny quirk of my equipment. But we're still puzzled by these short pulses and a very accurately maintained pulse period. A colleague managed to get a dispersion measurement, an estimate of how far away the thing was. You'll have seen a rainbow, which is when raindrops disperse light into its constituent frequencies. They travel at slightly different velocities, which is how they appear separate. Something similar happens with radio waves. Uh, electrons out in the ionosphere, magnetosphere, disperse the radio wave, and the high frequencies arrive before the low frequencies. How much they arrive before? depends on how many electrons they've come past. We made a guess at how many electrons there were out in space, and we guessed that this thing was about 200 light years away. So it's not an artificial satellite that the Russians have launched into space that's doing something funny. This is on a much bigger scale. It's beyond the solar system, but it's in the Milky Way. We did look for a Doppler effect, as I've mentioned, to see 
if they were on a planet orbiting their sun. But finding the second was really important. And shortly after Christmas, I found a third and a fourth. What we now believe these things to be are a very compact star, a star that has a mass comparable to the sun, but it's all squeezed into a ball about 10 miles across or 10 kilometers radius. When you shrink a big body that's spinning, it spins faster. Some of you may have seen an experiment in a physics laboratory where somebody sits on a rotating stool and if they have their arms out sideways, they rotate slowly, but if they pull their arms into their chest, they rotate faster. This thing has shrunk down from being millions of kilometers in size to being about 10 kilometers and it has correspondingly spun up its conservation of angular momentum. We also suspect they have very strong magnetic fields, really strong, and that somehow we still probably don't, well, one or two people think they understand, the rest of us certainly don't understand how a radio beam is formed and comes out with over the poles where the magnetic field lines are open. And because the magnetic field is inclined, as the star rotates, that beam sweeps out a great arc across the sky. And if it sweeps across the Earth, we see a pulse once every rotation. So that's basically what we think a pulsar is, something incredibly dense, 10 kilometers radius, spinning very fast, very strong magnetic field, and out of the magnetic poles comes something a bit like a lighthouse beam that sweeps around the sky. Pulsar properties are pretty esoteric, but I'll uh, give you an outline of them without going into the advanced physics in much detail. They've typically got a mass of a thousand million, 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 million tons, about one and a half times the mass of the sun but that's all jammed into a ball of radius 10 kilometers. So the average density is like the density of the nucleus of the atom. It is very dense. And because we believe they're rich in neutrons, they're known as neutron stars. A thimble full of pulsar material would weigh the same as the 7 billion people who live on the Earth. So if you can imagine cramming the whole population of the Earth into a thimble, that's what it would weigh if it was filled with material from a pulsar. Because it's very dense, there's a very strong gravitational force. Um, if you climbed a height of one micron, a millionth of a meter, on the surface of one of these stars, you'd do the same work as you do climbing Mount Everest here on Earth. And because the gravity is very strong, the atmosphere is very compressed. It's only 10 centimeters thick. So if you went to visit one of these stars, the atmosphere would be sloshing around your ankles and the rest of you would be in a very rarefied atmosphere. Gravity also bends light. So if you did go visit one of these stars, you could see over the horizon, you could see round the corner. The gravity also redshifts light. So if there were little green men on these stars, they would actually look to us like little red men. And gravity affects flocks. Um, your sat nav knows this, for instance, and corrects for it. On a neutron star with its extreme gravity, clocks tick two times slower than here on Earth. So one tick every two seconds, if you like. Not only is gravity strong, there's a very strong gradient of gravity. So if you go in to land on one of these things feet first, which is a sensible way to land, the extra gravity on your feet will literally pull your feet off your body. So your feet will land first, or bonk, and then your shins, and then your knees, and your thighs, and so on. So it's not a good environment to go visiting. 
there is a health warning here. You will not come back in one piece. Even if you call, curl up small in a ball, the gradient of gravity will get you. So don't go. There's also an enormous magnetic field. Um, to put this in context, if you've got any fridge magnets, their magnetic field is about a hundredth of a Tesla. Uh, a strong lab magnet might be 10 Tesla. These things have a field of 100 million Tesla. And because they're spinning, there's also a huge voltage drop of 1,000 million volts per centimeter. So going to visit one of these stars has a strong health warning. And don't take your credit cards either. They'll get wiped. All this rotates as a solid body. We believe that the pulse period we see is the rotation period of the star. And the range of periods observed is something like one and a half milliseconds. That's maybe still going down that lower limit up to about eight or maybe 10 seconds. So they're pretty fast. And you only observe them if you are not integrating for too long. Once you get one of these things spinning, it keeps spinning. And so it's a remarkably accurate timekeeper. They're good to about one part in 10 to the 16, one part in 10,000 million million. Or put differently, a typical pulsar's period has increased by about one second since the age of the dinosaurs. They're very good clocks. And because they're very good clocks, we have the opportunity to use them to test Einstein's theory of relativity. And this has been done and is being done with some exciting results. The name has been taken over. Um, there's a model of car called, a well, there was, I'm not sure if it's still in production, called a pulsar. There are, of course, watches called pulsars. I discovered some geraniums called pulsars. Quite a lot of things called pulsar these days. <laughs> Excuse me. The name was created by a journalist, science journalist of one of the more reputable UK broadsheets. And he came to interview us and said, what are you going to call these things? And we had thought quite a bit about this. We could have described them as pulsed radio sources or as pulsating radio sources. And we'd opted for pulsating radio sources because pulsed radio sources might imply somebody or bodies making it pulsed. In other words, little green men. So when he asked us asked what we were going to call these things, we said pulsating radio sources. No, 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 no. A short name. What about pulsar? By analogy with quasar. And so pulsar they've become. Going on with some of the amazing phenomena, because you've got all this mass and this huge gravity, the pressure at the very center is that number of times, I've forgotten how many zeros there are, times the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. The fastest known pulsar so far is one with a period of about one and a half milliseconds. And we'll see if the audio will work. Where's the cursor? You don't hear the individual pulses. You just hear the whine that goes, the note that they make. Um, the, I think the current fastest one has a period of about 1.4 milliseconds. Um, its period is less well established. There aren't so many leading zeros in this number, um, but it'll grow with time. They also find planets round some pulsars. Uh, this is because the planets tug the pulsar a little bit, the pulsar moves a little bit, and the pulse period gets Doppler shifted a little bit because of the movement. In fact, it turned out there weren't, it wasn't just one planet, there were three planets round a pulsar. The pulsar is called 1257 plus 12. 
its planets are quite close in by comparison with the Earth. If that's the surface of the sun, then on the same scale, that's where Mercury is, that's where Venus is, and Earth is off the bottom of the picture. So these planets are quite close in. Now, I can give you several very good reasons why there should not be planets around a pulsar. Um, one is that the pulsar is formed when a massive star explodes, what's called a supernova. And that would probably disrupt any planets that there happen to be. They would run away, be blown away. So maybe these planets have been grabbed after the pulsar was formed, or maybe they survived the explosion, or maybe a bit of both. Uh, they now know that there's an even tinier fourth one as well which isn't on this slide. The roundest known thing in the universe is the orbit of this particular pulsar round another star. And it's round to five microns in over half a million kilometers. In terms of eccentricity, that's about 10 to the minus seven. Ah, sorry, I'm going backwards. Right. And if something falls onto the surface of a pulsar or a neutron star, it'll hit the surface traveling at half the speed of light. So strong is the gravity. And it may hit the surface in several bits as well. It may get torn apart by the tidal forces. So these things are really, really extreme. There's nothing else like them in the universe so far, but they're now quite well known. There's Thousands of them known, they're increasingly well studied, and we hope soon to be able to detect them in external galaxies as well, but so far only in our galaxy. So before this gives somebody epileptic fits, let me pass on and say thank you very much for your attention and your interest. And back to the chair. You're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> I believe we can take questions from the audience at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Belgrinell, for that excellent overview. Um, we have two questions so far. Um, the first one is, if something got close to a pulsar, would it instantly get crushed by how strong the gravity is? You've touched on that already. Yes, um, it would be crushed, but also pulled into pieces, um, disrupted totally by the gradient of gravity. So there's, there's two things going on. There's extreme gravity crushing, and there's a gradient of gravity splitting the crushed thing into lots of tiny crushed pieces. The charming atmosphere. Excellent. Another question um, from a participant is, how does a pulsar shrink in size? It's a consequence of the big explosion of the star that the original star, of which this was the core. And in part, there's probably compression on it during the explosion. Um, indeed, there must be compression on it as part of the explosion. So the, the normal atomic structure collapses. The electrons no longer are there outside the nucleus, giving the whole thing size and shape. Uh, it's become a much more solid entity and a much smaller entity. Excellent. Uh, the next question is, why are pulsars 1.5 times the mass of the sun and 10 kilometers wide, as opposed to, say, some different measurement? Why is the size so defined? Yeah. Um, this 1.44 is a very critical size in um, stellar astrophysics. It's, I don't think I can explain adequately um, how it comes about, anything more massive than that might well turn into a black hole or have already turned into a black hole. Uh, it seems to be the mass that um, the neutron star structure can sustain without turning into a black hole. So that's probably what is actually determining it. Um, its spin rate is to do with conservation of angular momentum. If you shrink a spinning body, it spins faster. And this was originally a big 
slowly spinning star. A lot of the materials crushed into the center and along with the shrinking comes the speeding up. Okay. Um, the next question is, are there any binary quasars? Would that be possible? Yes, there are. There is one in particular that's been very well studied. Um, I think I only know of one where both stars are pulsars, but you do sometimes find a pulsar twinned with a more ordinary star. There's quite a few of those, but there is one double pulsar. And it's been very, very useful for testing out some of the theories of gravity. You know, was Einstein right? Yeah, probably. Um, but really forcing the, forcing the issue, really testing the, the theory very, very thoroughly. That's all ongoing, but yeah. All right. Um, next question. What are some of the challenges with locating detecting pulsars today? They're not very strong sources is probably the major challenge. So you need a big radio telescope. But if you have a big radio telescope, it has a fairly small beam, a fairly small search area on the sky. So you've got great sensitivity in a tiny, tiny patch. And if you want to scan the sky to see if there's anything interesting, you know, in, in that whole square, you spend a long, long time rastering it with this very, very fine beam. <laughs> So it's a trade-off. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna summarize a couple of questions here. So several questions are touching on the theme of how did one go from detecting pulsars using radio frequency to determining their other properties, for example, what they're made of or other astrophysical properties. Right. What they're made of is theoretical physics. Uh, we don't have any experimental confirmation of what they're made of. Um, the magnetic field and the electric field, we have a reasonable stab at because we know a bit about magnetic fields of ordinary stars. Um, and if at the end of their life, the core shrinks, we can estimate how much the field goes up as the core shrinks. So some of it is sort of measurement, measurement plus inspired guess, I'd say. Um, some of it is purely theoretical predictions, but the whole seems to hang together pretty well. Uh, we haven't had any major crises in, in the theory of neutron stars, which is what these things are believed to be, largely made of neutrons. Excellent. And then summarizing another several questions, um, there's several questions to do with sort of the creation of pulsars. Um, how likely is it that a star will become a pulsar? Mm -hmm. At what mass range is it guaranteed after a supernova event? Um, right. How much smaller yeah. do you have to be to get a, a black hole versus a pulsar and so on? Right, well, black holes come in a huge range of masses. And if a pulsar with its strong gravity pulled a lot of material onto itself, it might ultimately collapse to be a black hole itself. So we know of black holes in the middles of quasars that have masses about a million times the mass of the sun. Uh, and we go right down to a few times the mass of the sun, certainly down to two times the mass of the sun. So black holes come in, in a vast range of sizes. Um, the gravity of a pulsar uh, is comparable to the gravity of a black hole of the same mass. But if the black hole has much, much greater mass, then it's got much greater gravity. Uh, were there other bits of the question, Lara, that I've failed to answer? Touched on, on most of them, yes. Um, so I'm just looking, we have quite a few questions here. So I'm trying to kind of summarize some, some common themes quickly. Um, several questions about the evolution of the pole and wire method of radio astronomy through to the, the DISH radio. Um, mm -hmm arrays that we have now. Can you comment on sort of how that evolution happened and how the yeah. technology developed? So it all happened post Second World War, Second World War. So starting in about 1945, um, people who had been physicists, university physicists before the war, had maybe done radar research during the war. At the end of the war, 
took some of the radar receiving equipment back to their home bases. And also um, as part of reparations, we got a number of German radar receiving dishes. So they became university radio telescopes as well. So it was very much driven by people who had done radar during the Second World War. It was the peacetime spin-off of radar and using very much that kind of equipment. First of all, to establish that there were radio emitting things up in the sky, that had to be done first. Um, and then when it was found that there were lots of these quasars, then getting bigger and better radio telescopes, bigger and better receivers, more sensitive receivers. Gradually moving from vacuum tubes, valves to transistors and so on. Okay. Um, a few questions pivoting away from pulsars for a moment. Um, there's a question of what general advice would you have for future physicists and also um, commenting on the current environment for women in physics. Right. Um, the current environment for women in physics is um, getting much, much better. It has been the case that women have been a fairly small subset of physicists, but now there are more and more and physics departments are recognizing that it's good to have diverse membership of the department. And so there's a, a lot of efforts to make sure that particular groups are, don't suffer any kind of prejudice. Doesn't just apply to gender, also applies to color. So that's important work. Um, I think diversity is very, very important in a physics department. I think it makes a physics department much stronger. So I would encourage people who feel they are a minority grouping for whatever reason um, to hang in there and become physicists because slightly different perspectives usually result in breakthroughs. And in terms of any advice for future uh, physicists? Um, physics is an amazing subject. Um, I'm particularly biased towards the astrophysics. There's a lot going on at the moment. Um, big new neutrino detector at the South Pole. Um, I think they've found one at least so far. Uh, so lots of new bits of equipment. Um, stretching the wavelengths and the, the kind of radiation that we're um, looking for. I'm sure there are comparable developments in other branches of physics. I'm just not so aware of them. So there is a lot going on. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening and a lot of exciting stuff that I guess is about to happen as well. So if you are at all talented in physics, uh, I would say hang in there. There's good stuff just around the corner. I like that very much. Um, actually, following on a sort of follow-up question for that, several questions I think are, are sort of hinting towards um, multi-messenger astronomy, gravitational mm -hmm. waves, and what new physics we might look for from objects like pulsars yeah. in the multi-messenger era. Yeah. The gravitational wave development is another very important one. A whole new spectrum. <laughs> And is there any any particular you know, signals that you find very promising in this area or hard to say at this point? Yeah, um, the things that the gravitational wave detectors are picking up tend to be black holes. They have a few neutron stars um, and they have a few examples of two neutron stars merging to give a nice gravitational wave signal. But I must say amongst the first sort of hundred detections, the big surprising thing was the number of black holes and the mass range of the black holes merging that they're picking up. So that's a whole new spectrum opening up. Wow, really just opening up. <laughs> Lots of science for future, future would be physicists. Mm. Okay, a couple of additional questions. Um, one question asks, um, how you were able in your own work um, to deal with the radio telescope aiming that was done with analog equipment to create some sort of uh, phase shifting array. 
Question says, as a ham radio operator, I'd imagine that the ground coupling between the antenna and the red ground was a nightmare. Right. Um, the, those who know a bit about antennae may have noticed that the picture I showed you had a lot of rows of stuff. <laughs> it was actually rows of dipoles. And so it is a bit like a radio equivalent of a diffraction grating. But we could put delays in between the rows, which is a bit like tipping the diffraction grating. And that gave us some steerage in um, what's called declination, roughly latitude on the sky. Uh, we didn't steer in the other direction. We allowed the rotation of the Earth to swing the telescope beam around. Do you think that's enough of an answer? <laughs> I think that's good. All right, um, let's see, other questions. Um, a couple of questions here asking you to just comment on the process of the Nobel Prize being awarded for this work, what that was like for you and um, your subsequent career. Yeah, well, I, I remember the day rather vividly because it was a very special day for other reasons. Um, as I hinted, I got married very soon after the discovery of pulsars. I left radio astronomy and I found jobs in astronomy near where my husband was working and he moved around quite a bit. And there was one point in my career where I found myself in a space science laboratory. Uh, I was recruited to look after an X-ray astronomy satellite that was about to launch. And I remember the day of the launch very vividly. Um, we didn't have uh, video links, but there was an audio link. And we all came into work at about 7.30 in the morning to listen to the countdown and, and so on. Uh, and it all went very well. And by about nine o'clock, it was clear it was all going well. And we sort of all drifted back to our offices. And the computer programmer said, oh, we better get those programs working now. It's clearly going to work. <laughs> so, and just after noon, a colleague came rushing into my office. Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? Oh, my God, the satellites failed. But it wasn't. It was the announcement of the Nobel Prize to Tony Hewish, my thesis advisor, and Martin Ryle, the head of the group, for pioneering work in radio astronomy. Uh, my colleague, I think, expected to see me angry, but... Um, one can think quite quickly sometimes, and I realized this was the first time that a Nobel Prize had gone to radio astronomy. Indeed, probably the first time to any observational astronomy. There is no astronomy Nobel Prize. The astronomers who've got the prize have got the physics prize. And this was the first time that the physics committee had recognized that there was good physics in astrophysics. And I knew it created a huge precedent and that other astronomers would work, would get it subsequently, as has indeed been the case. So although my colleague expected to see, you know, smoke coming out my ears with fury, in fact, I was very, very pleased, very delighted. But it was a memorable day, what with the launch of the satellite and that all within a few hours of each other. <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you for that. Um, several questions to do with pulsars, asking about whether pulsars can ever change into other kinds of stellar objects, whether our star could ever become a pulsar, um, questions along those lines. Right. I don't think the sun could ever become a pulsar. It's not quite massive enough. It probably would need to be half as massive again in order to collapse. Um, just because it's not got enough self-gravity to, to get it collapsed down to a neutron star. Um, things that are bigger than about five times the mass of the sun tend to become black holes. It's still debated what the full range of neutron stars might be. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a consensus yet, but um, certainly by the time you get to five solar masses, probably by the time you get to three solar masses, you're going to collapse to a black hole. But under that, a neutron star, a pulsar is a possibility. 
Okay. And um, a personal question. Do you still have the original recording from when you first saw a poster? No, sadly. Um, graduate students had to sign a piece of paper which said all their recordings belong to the department. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and um, one question about whether the, the dynamic process of has the formation of a pulsar ever been observed? So not quite a pulsar yet, but something approaching. Mm. No, I don't think so, but it's something we look out for. You know, we see a good big star going supernova and we watch it and see if we can get any hint of what's going on. But to the best of my knowledge, I don't think anybody's been able to say, ha ha, there it goes. <laughs> And one additional question, um, the shape of orbits um, of a pulsar around in, in any system. Um, so the question says the a pulsar around a star moving, um, are the, the shape of the orbits circular to elliptical understood? Um, must there be a particular shape for the orbit, I guess is the question. Um, the orbit's likely to be elliptical if the pulsar and the other star are bound together. Um, if it becomes hyperbola, it means the pulsar is passing through and is on its way out to outer space once again. But where we have found binaries, um, they are, as we say, bound. The orbits are elliptical. Um, we don't have much evidence of such systems breaking up. You know, we don't see lots of pulsars zipping around in space, you know, clearly escaping. We just don't see many of those, so, yeah. Okay. And then um, you touched on this one already, but someone was asking um, if you could elaborate a bit more on the way that you measure the time interval of a pulsar. So how exactly do you decide what the interval is based on the data? Right, well, if you're using old technology like I did, you have a printout which goes zip, 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 and you measure the spacing between the peaks. <laughs> There's digital equivalence of that now. <laughs> Excellent. And I think you have, um, oh, one more. Uh, sorry, I was about to say we've answered most of the, the technical questions. I was going to jump in one more, but we have one more from the audience. It says, if it's not too technical a question, you mentioned there was some debate about how the radio pulse is produced. Is it possible to sketch the competing ideas and possibilities to test them? There. It's clearly a very difficult environment to analyze. You've got strong gravity, rapid rates of rotation, very strong magnetic fields, and you'll also have strong electrical fields. And the physics, I think, is foul. <laughs> it's foul in the sense it's really, really difficult because of all the extremes. And I personally stay well clear of it because I think it's far too difficult. Um, there are one or two people who seem to be able to, to work with all those constraints and produce theories. Um, and I'm not personally equipped to sort of comment on whether they're right or wrong or possibly right or possibly wrong. Uh, but it is, it is a very difficult physics environment, very difficult to do the physics because of all the extremes. But it looks as if some people have done the calculations and they seem sensible. All right. One more question from the audience. Um, what are you working on in this field at the moment? I'm supposed to be retired, <laughs> supposed to be. Um, what I'm particularly watching at the moment are things called fast radio bursts, which were accidentally discovered by pulsar astronomers. Um, pulsar astronomers have to check that the pulses they pick up are coming from that thing out in space and not from the lab next door. So they automatically check what's called the dispersion of the pulse. As it travels through space, the high frequencies arrive first, the low frequencies later. So it kind of whistles down. I'll try and whistle it. So descending note. And how fast it descends depends on how far it's come. If it's nearby, it's a very short, sharp descent. If it's far, far away, it's a very slow descent. 
And astronomers always look for this descent because it's one way of distinguishing from a pulse in the lab next door. A pulse from outer space will show some, whereas next go, go, and that's it. And some pulsar astronomers were checking this automatically and they picked up a beautiful pulse with a lovely sweeping curve down. But when you worked out how far away it was, it was away beyond our galaxy. Thank you very much. Miles beyond our galaxy. Thank you very much. And that was the first of what we now know as fast radio bursts. There are things out there in the galaxy that produce maybe just one or maybe several bursts. They're not periodic, typically. They go something like that. And we know of these, we call these things fast radio bursts. And it was the pulsar astronomers who first picked them up. And they're amazing things that we can pick up a, a pulse from a star in another galaxy. We've positioned a few of these things and yeah, okay, they're not necessarily from the center of the galaxy. They're maybe from somewhere else in a galaxy. And they're a very hot topic of research at the moment, which is very close to pulsar astronomy because the technology is so very similar. And what they are, I'd say that's still a very open question. So watch out for fast radio bursts. Sounds like a very interesting question indeed. Okay, um, looks like we have uh, one more question coming in um, from Mark Pitt. I don't know if you'd like to ask his question directly. Sure. Yeah, thanks again, Professor Bell Burnell, for a fantastic talk and, and uh, your patience in answering all of our many questions. Uh, my question relates back to your description of the Pulsar discovery. And I think you said in there that one of the things you did is you asked another group with another radio telescope to uh, to look and see if they saw it. I just had a sociological question. Were you concerned that they might see it and go off and publish it? Or did they collaborate with you on the publication? Just how, how did all that work out? It was another group within the radio astronomy group in Cambridge. So it was the telescope next door to mine, if you like, <laughs> you know, on the same field, <laughs> but a separate telescope, separate receiver. I see. Okay, so it was friendly. It was friendly <laughs> fire, yes. Okay, very, very good. Uh, and um, and and when you originally uh, uh, when did you decide to go ahead and publish? When were you sort of what what made you convinced that you were ready to publish? Is there any way to uh, quantify that, that somehow? Or, by, or go ahead. By that stage, we had four objects. Um, one of them was quite fast. Um, the other three were fairly similar. They were all in different parts of the sky. Um, they showed slightly different dispersions, so they were at different distances. Uh, and it looked as if we had found the top of a population of something, you know, the, the brightest of a population. Okay. So we really had to go public. Great. Thank you very much. And just one more question. Um, I wondered if you could comment on, in your career, you've balanced a lot of things, you know, your career as an astronomer, raising a family, advocacy work within physics. Um, do you have any comments on how to balance all those elements and the perspective you have now? It's never easy. Um, I think it's getting better. Uh, when I became pregnant, I went to the head of department and said, what maternity leave am I, am I entitled to? And he said, maternity leave? Never heard of it. And he was right. The university did not have maternity leave at that time because they'd very few female faculty. <laughs> so there's been quite a lot of improvement in universities in my lifetime. Um, and I've been responsible for driving some of that because I've been part of a group that set up an accreditation scheme, basically, is your department women friendly? 
Um, it's now gone to the United States. Um, it's no longer just gender, it's also race and other dimensions. Um, the name has just temporarily escaped me. It's run out of the Treble AS in Washington. Um, duh, anyway. But this is a generalization of the Athena's wand? Yes, it is. Yes, builds on it, improves it. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. So I don't see any further questions in the Q&A. Um, just one last call. Is there any questions that I didn't get to? If, if so, drop them in the Q&A and we'll... All right, I think we may have may have covered it. Thank you very much again for your comments and for your patience with all our questions. And thank you, Lara, for your work, grouping them and fielding them. It's very helpful. <laughs> thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Keep safe. <laughs> There's lots of thank yous coming in on the Q&A, by the way. <laughs> so many appreciative folks. <laughs> um,